Early Facebook and Google investor Roger McNamee, author of the new book Zucked, joins us from San Francisco. Roger, good morning. Good to see you again. How likely How is it you, that uh, I'm good? How likely are we able to turn the temperature down on this whole thing? I mean, Carl, your guess is as good as mine. This whole trade thing with China is nuts, right? I mean, the symbiosis between the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy has been good for both sides for decades. And the deal's not entirely fair to us, but on balance, though, we've done really well from it. And so trying to unwind that deal in bits and pieces without a really good strategic plan it has produced exactly the kind of horrible outcomes we've seen for farmers and also for tech companies. And, you know, I have no idea where this is going to go, but I find it deeply troubling. And I think for investors, you know, the the relief we're feeling today, you know, has to be tempered at least a little bit by the knowledge that this just keeps happening. Right. Roger, I'd love to get your take on the FT's got a piece out today saying that the White House is miscalculating here, and people can disagree yeah. about that if they want. They do point out it's going to prod the Chinese to address their own weaknesses and, de and develop their own fully dependent supply chains, and it's going to bifurcate the global technology universe. Is that how the Valley sees this right now? Well, you know, Carl, the problem in my mind is that we're the ones if, who should be doing exactly that. If, if, if it is so important for us to be independent of China, and... <laughs> I can see the case that that would be true. Then we have to develop our own supply chains. We have to actually radically increase the rate of investments, you know, in manufacturing. In you know, you'd have to do it in ways that that work economically. And at the moment, I don't see anybody even talking about that. I think we're essentially dependent on China without a plan B. And given the current politics, that strategy, in my mind, is you know just asking for trouble. Yeah, Roger, I mean, back in 2014, China created, what, the National Guideline for Development of, Se of the Semiconductor Industry. It was at the time a $22 billion fund, a.k.a. the big fund. The country's definitely been working towards creating a more self-sustaining in-country supply chain. Certainly this whole situation with Huawei and ZTE last year really uh, shines a light on the fact that there's still a long way to go. Yeah. Um, but in terms of that situation in terms of the fact that you do have forced technology transfer i know there was a report out of europe just a couple of days ago looking at increased uh, levels of that by companies there too does the u.s need to take a more multi-pronged approach to all of this i think you touched on it before this idea that maybe we need to invest more in manufacturing in research here yeah i want to be clear morgan i wish we could go back to the world where we trusted China. I mean, again, they would come in and there'd be industrial espionage and lots of things we didn't like. But on balance, we were getting a great deal. Now we're in this situation where, for whatever reason, there is conflict. And from this conflict, we either need to have a strategy of going back, you know, and trying to fix the relationship or making ourselves independent, which requires a much higher level of investment, which on balance I think would be great for investors in the long run, but in the short run you'd be giving up some earnings because you'd have to make those investments. And, and I think you'd also see some increase in prices of products, but you'd see a lot more independence, a lot more jobs. There'd be a lot of benefits you know, that came from it. Roger. But I don't see anybody talking that way. It's, it's interesting to hear you uh, refer to the status quo with China as a great deal because I don't know a lot of executives I've talked to who would who would really frame it that way. I mean, uh, it was livable, especially for, for big companies who had figured out exactly how much, how many millions they were willing to give to fund uh, China's own technology development and felt like they could sort of hide enough of their IP to make it workable. But, I mean, a, a good deal, especially given how much China's been investing in both growing and protecting their own IP, wasn't this headed for catastrophe anyway? No, John, I, I misspoke. I was speaking relative to consumers. Our entire consumer economy is based on this relationship with China. And we have done everything from a policy point of view to make sure consumers got the absolutely lowest prices and greatest variety of, of choice possible. And that meant essentially leaning on our industrial companies to do things that are really bad for them in the long run. So, no, your point's completely correct. If you're a company... The deal with China has been terrible because they steal your intellectual property. They do not give you free access to their markets. All of that's been a disaster. But we've run our 
foreign policy in China around consumer needs entirely. And, you know, in my mind, the point you make is a really important one, which is that we're now conducting a foreign policy that says we're not going to do that anymore, but we haven't actually thought through all the implications, what that means for consumers, what that means for corporations, and frankly, what it means for our industrial capacity in the United States, which at the moment, you know, can't replace what we get in China. Right. I was talking to a, a public company CEO uh, the other day who said that his new line, Roger, at investment conferences, his opening line is no exposure to China. And I wonder if entrepreneurs in the Valley or CEOs who, by choice or not, were never able to get into China are now sort of strutting their stuff. Well, you know, I guess. I mean, I look at this and I think to myself, if, you know, if we do not have a functional relationship with China, there's going to be a period of time with less economic output because we can't replace it anywhere else. And uh, so what my hope is that we find a soft landing here and that everybody takes the time to, to pick the strategy they want and, and implement it without a, without a hard landing. But, you know, I don't think we're... We're, we're not running this foreign policy at the moment in a way that gives you a lot of confidence that, that there's a whole plan for transitioning from a China consumer-centric model to an independent, you know, industrial-centric model. Uh, Roger, switch gears to Tesla. Obviously a big story today. Shares are down 10 of 11 days as Morgan Stanley cuts the worst case scenario down to $10 a share. It was at 97. The change driven by concerns around Chinese demand for Tesla products. Uh, we should point out, uh, Roger, overall their target is still 230, but this is what they call their bear case. It's sort of a quirk in Morgan Stanley research. Um, and it's a lot about China demand and missing that forecast. It's about oversaturation in retail. What's your take on it today? So, Carl, do you ever remember research analysts having worst case scenarios put on <laughs> stocks that they expect to go up? I mean, that is new ground for me. And I got to be honest with you, th that headline obviously gets a tremendous amount of attention. And to me, the thing that makes it sad is that Tesla's created this amazing brand. I mean, you won't find a a product out there with a happier customer base than Tesla. And yet we're sitting there having a conversation about a range of outcomes between 230 bucks a share and nine bucks a share. And I'm well, looking at this cases, and going, yeah. right. I'm going, I mean, what the hell's going on here? This is like, you know, I look at Tesla again, it's an incredible brand with a CEO who, for whatever reason, is distracted and, and mostly focused on other things. And that's a tragedy. And the shareholders deserve better than that. The customers of the product deserve better than that. And what I'd really love to see is, you know, somebody who's really passionate about making Tesla into a world-class car company run that company every single day because that doesn't feel like what you got today. And for the shareholder, that's a so what bad happens deal. So what happens if they run out of money, Roger? What's, what's your kind of worst case scenario for them? They've, they've got this brand. They've got plenty of goodwill. Does somebody snap them up? Does yeah. somebody, what happens? Well, it, wouldn't you? I mean, i got to believe there's a lot of people who would love to own Tesla. The issue is that car companies, I mean, Tesla's still got a much better valuation than most other car companies, maybe any other car company. And so I don't know how that goes down. But what I do know is that it is a car business. And there's a lot of engineering that goes into making cars. It's not like a new thing that people don't understand. It's well-traveled ground. And they should be able to do so much better on the manufacturing than they're doing right now. And you know, if there is a problem in China, that's a I don't see how you fix that, because they have literally billions of dollars in business in China. And if they lose access to that market, you're going to have a hole. And, uh, you know, they need to have they need to have a plan B, just like the whole economy needs relative to China. You know, Roger, this Morgan Stanley note, Adam Jonas also covers space. So he's been keeping a very close eye on SpaceX as well. And one of the things he writes here is that maybe you do see some sort of partnership uh, strategic, industrial, et cetera, with Tesla, but that maybe as the share price declines, maybe that's with SpaceX and not another auto manufacturer. What do you think? You know something? Weirder things have happened, right? But I just look at this and I go, why does Silicon Valley have to be operating in kind of the lunatic fringe of management style? <laughs> Right, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, you've got all these people whose personal lives are interfering in the business. And I just find it tragic and sad because, you know, these are obviously brilliant people and it's like they need a friend and maybe a pony.
Roger, thanks. As we take a look at the uh, board of directors over at Tesla, obviously a big day uh, for, for the stock today uh, as it's down 10 of 11 and um, still above the IPO price of 17 back in 2010. Roger, we'll see you soon. <laughs> I would hope so.